You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. All right, everyone, we're winding down 2022, and we're looking back on some of our episodes, and there may be a few that you missed. However, this one in particular we think is important. And why is because in Washington, what starts out as voluntary always has the potential to become regulatory, and that's going to affect your business. So what we're talking about is ESG. I know it sounds like a boring medical procedure, but it's not. It stands for environmental, social, and governance. And ESG scoring is quickly becoming an indicator of a well-run company that focuses on long-term profits. Sounds fancy. Well, I'm going to shut up so you can hear more about what we're talking about here and what retailers need to know about ESG planning. Enjoy. The Fuels Institute had our annual conference at the end of May in Indianapolis, and one of the themes was how do you decarbonize the transportation space and what is motivating us to reduce uh, carbon from the transportation sector. And one of the themes that kept coming through was the whole idea of environmental, social governance policies, principles, and reporting. Um, and so we want to explore that a little bit today. And I'm thrilled to have an individual that I have known probably 20 years since I entered the market um, when he was with Exxon Mobil years ago. Um, an individual that I have always enjoyed working with, uh, somebody who's pragmatic, practical, thinking long term forward. Uh, Mike Roman is now the senior fellow for public policy and ESG at the American Council for Capital Formation, also a member of the Fuels Institute Board of Advisors. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. John and Jeff, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thanks for having me. You know, I think back to the times when you and I first got to know each other. I was a lobbyist on Capitol Hill. You were up managing some of the government relations advocacy for ExxonMobil. How things have changed <laughs> in the last 20 years. Things have changed. Uh, things have evolved. Uh, you know, we're in a new world. Uh, I think the one thing that, you know, I s- think is important for us to understand is that the fuels and convenience retailers in this country play one of the most significant roles in terms of the evolution of transportation and carbon reduction initiatives. And now, uh, through that evolution, it's being woven into ESG, environmental, social, and governance, for anybody who may not be familiar with it yet. And that is going to be amplified by this new SEC proposed rule on climate. It is going to bring to the front the importance of relationships between suppliers and the uh, retailers at a level that we haven't seen before. And and with with ESG, it, it... I think a lot of people didn't even hear what they didn't have any concept or hear about ESG a year or so ago. And now it's gained so much traction and and it it is becoming such an important part of the fuels industry and where it's rolling out. And it's also, it's more than saying I'm gonna do something or I'd like to do something. It it is now getting codified to a certain extent in, in various pieces of, Is it legislation, regulation, or or what is going on, Mike? Well, let's look at it this way. Um, And John brought up a good point a moment ago about the fact that things have changed. If if I go back to as far as I can go back, there was an economist called uh, Milton Friedman. And Milton argued that a company has no social responsibility to (laughs) public or society. His only responsibility is to the shareholders. He said that in 1970. So what was that, 52 years ago? Yeah. Uh, I was studying economics uh, at the time, getting my economics degree. Um, I'm not sure where Milton Friedman would be today. Uh, I think he would have evolved along the way. There are some who disagree with that. And the fact of the matter is what's happened, uh, John and Jeff, is that in the 80s, we talked about environmental health and safety. I think you all remember that. The 90s became more of a focus towards sustainability, uh, and we began to see the uh, beginning of this whole ESG movement at that point, although it didn't have that name. We got into corporate social responsibility, which is kind of bringing in that Mm -hmm. social and governance 
piece. And now here we are with ESG. Um, the E, for anybody who needs to know, is all about conservation. It's all about uh, climate, natural resources. S is all about social. It's all about how you treat people, the recognition of diversity inside companies and outside the companies. And the G is all about company leadership. How do you run your internal controls, your shareholder rights? Again, all this now starts to get amplified. And if I'm an international company, I not only have to deal with what's going on in the U.S., but as a uh, responsible uh, organization, I have to look at what's going on in other parts of the world. And quite frankly, uh, we are behind in the U.S. where they are, for example, in the EU at this particular point in time. You know, Jeff, you mentioned the rise of attention in this last year and a half. I think a lot of that's driven by the fact that a couple of years ago, BlackRock, who controls ten trillion dollars of investment assets, made the announcement. This has to be a critical element. After the uh, Copenhagen or the uh, Glasgow meeting last year and climate, the leading financial institutions came together and formed a new entity, <clears throat> controlling one hundred thirty trillion dollars of assets. And the last document that I, when I was reading through some of their principles was, we want to invest. We want to make sure climate is included in every investment decision going forward. Now. From a fuel retailer, convenience retailer perspective, well, I mean, that's I'm not publicly traded. I don't really care. That's a really, really dangerous position because banks are now starting to condition underwriting and loan terms based upon your ESG plan. So it's affecting everybody. And, Mike, to your point, the SEC proposal it is going to bring in so many other people because of the way it's structured for the big privately, uh, publicly traded companies. That is exactly right, John. That is exactly right. You know, um, I, in, in my role at uh, the American Council for Capital Formation, I spent a lot of time working the ESG issue. And I can tell you unequivocally at this point, I've had discussions with banks. And uh, actually had a couple of them while I was down in Miami as well. Uh, they are being asked by their shareholders where are you investing your money and where are you uh who are you financing and um in terms of financing the discussions around the fuels and convenience retailers becomes critically important because banks are being asked that question and we know and we have to be able to effectively communicate that those retailers are going to be needed for decades, which means that they are going to buy new sites and they're probably going to introduce uh, electric vehicle service equipment along the way and other types of fuels. But they're also going to have to retain and they're going to have to maintain and upgrade their existing facilities. And to do that, they're going to have to borrow money. And in order to borrow the money, they're going to have to explain to a bank so a bank can explain to its shareholders where that money is going. That's a challenge, and it's a new one that they haven't had to face. Does it make it more challenging? Uh, and, and certainly, if these things happen, you figure out how do you comply, how do you how do you do the best you can, how do you, how are you a good corporate citizen, regardless? But with the rise in fuel prices, which we don't know where they're going, but they they are quite elevated as we sit right now in June. Um, does how does that play a role in all this? Because there's there's a need to get fuel out there right now, reduce prices as much as possible, because obviously consumers are feeling pain right. at the pump. At the same time, so you have one foot standing here, let's get fuel, let's bring down prices, let's do all those things. The other foot is looking at how far do I reach out with ESG and other things that are coming. And how do those two things either complement or, or conflict with each other? Well, I think at this stage, uh, we want to aim for being complementary as best we possibly can. And I think the sooner that retailers realize that they have that obligation, and under the SEC guidance, if in fact we do get what is called scope three, where our retailers are going to have to be able to report back to their suppliers 
the types of fuels that they're using, how they're being sold, and in utilizing, thank God for the work, great work the Fuels Institute has done, uh, Jeff Hove and uh, Ryan Scott putting together uh, the uh, ESG integrity program, hopefully that will be made easier. But I think part and parcel of all this is that you need to be able to explain to the public in a way that they understand that the road to uh, net zero, uh, as I have recently drafted an article, is not a one-lane road. It's a multi-lane highway. It's going to take a lot of fuels, and it's going to take a lot of thinking about the realities of technology and the availability of resources to let us continue to be able to utilize fuels in an efficient way, in an environmentally sound way, that allows our economies to continue to be able to grow so that we can continue to pave this road to net zero. You know, that's a, I mean... I just finished recording another podcast for another organization before I got on this with you guys. And the last question was, John, what are you excited about in the market? And I said, you know, I'm really excited because there are some brilliant people, brilliant organizations working diligently to find solutions that will reduce carbon, reduce criteria pollutants, benefit the transportation space, benefit people as well as the environment. And there's so much opportunity out there. But at the same time, on the flip side, I'm really concerned because we seem to be going down politically a one track, a one way road where simplicity is the enemy of effectiveness. Decarbonization equals electric vehicles in their mind, and they're not opening up the opportunities for these innovations from these brilliant people, much smarter than I can ever pretend to be to bring solutions to market. And if we cut off our nose to spite our face and we say we're only going one direction and we don't allow this innovation investment to flourish, we're going to wake up 20 years ago, wow, we are in real big trouble because we haven't taken advantage of the opportunities that are in front of us. Right. And part of what's happening, going back, um, I agree with you 100%, John, and going back to Jeff's point, uh, when you look at where we are with fuel prices, it's it's a wake-up call at this particular point in time. Uh, and it's a terrible wake-up call because it's going to be conflated with uh, higher prices in a number of different areas, including uh, food. When you look at that and you say to yourself, you know, what do I need to know about where I'm going? I need to realize I have to make investments in this business. The suppliers have got to continue to be able to do the things that they're doing in order to be able to provide the products. And our retailers, to the point I was making a little bit earlier, are going to have to be able to sustain their models uh, for decades. And they will change along the way and they will evolve, but they will need to be able to retain because customers will demand them they're going to need to be able to retain their ability to sell the fuels they sell today. You hey, know, Jeff, that's that, that point Mike just made is huge. You've got the pressure from the government. You have the pressure from the financial institutions, whether you're publicly traded or privately. But you also have an evolving demographic of the population that is much more attuned with environmental stewardship. And they're making decisions who they want to work for and who they want to shop with do business with based upon, do they share my values? And if I think back to when I was growing up, man, it didn't matter if a company shared my values. One, I was a kid and how many values, um, two, then I became a lobbyist. And I checked my values at the door. Right. Um, so <laughs> I'm, maybe I'm the bad model for this, but I don't, I never thought about, does this company that I'm going to buy this product from share my values? I couldn't care less. That's evolving. That's changing. And so the the pressure from financial institutions, governments, your customers, your employees, your communities is just growing. And any organization that doesn't pay attention to this is doing it at their own peril. You're absolutely right, John. And, and to your point about advocacy, this is why I'm saying I think, you know, there's an opportunity here for the suppliers, the retailers, and Groups like NACS, 
the Fuels Institute, the organization I'm with, American Council for Capital Formation, to be able to educate on what the realities and what the technical limitations are at this point in time, where we're going, and to be able to make smart decisions about the directions we go. Look at the automobile companies right now. And John, you know this well, um, and you do too, Jeff. They are still developing advanced internal combustion engines. And they do it because they know that even though they may be forced to stop selling those engines at some point, they've got to continue to develop along the way because of the restrictions and the limitations we're seeing on the other side, such as the uh, electric vehicle development. We have an opportunity to educate, and we've got to continue to be able to do that. The SEC rule is positioning us in, in a strange way to be able to get more information out. I have spent the last four weeks looking at comments coming in on the uh, SEC rule, and I can tell you unequivocally, everybody wants to do good, but they think when they look at what's going on right now, the SEC rule is uh, very burdensome, very expensive to uh, work with, not clear about the materiality of the information that's going to come out and how shareholders and investors will look at that information. It needs to be worked. It needs time. There needs to be delays. And particularly for our retailers on the scope three piece, hopefully there's enough of a pause for us to look at how can you best develop information that is going to really be meaningful and helpful to investors who are going to be buried in information and are going to have to sort through what's important and again, what's material to the decisions that they're making. When you look at our fueling infrastructure, 100 million barrels of oil a day used worldwide, right. um, increasingly, and then you add in electricity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt that everyone that is involved uh, supplying this uh, on the broadest scale takes out loans, needs banks, et cetera. So what advice is there for, say, a three-store retailer out there who's listening to this and saying, well, do you know, I... I occasionally need a loan, but maybe I don't need a loan. How, how, what are a couple things they need to do uh, in terms of education and then secondarily in terms of planning for the next few years? Excellent question. First thing I would say is make sure you really know who your lenders are. Make sure that you're talking to them about the business. One of the things, uh, you know, that the Fuel Institute next do really well as they try to get information out, take the information that's available to you and share it with your lenders, share it with your customers. And one of the things that I've always proposed is that our retailers are the best advocates for this business. They know their markets, they know their communities, they have the best connections with uh, local lawmakers, state lawmakers, and many at a federal level. You've got to get them to understand what your needs are going to be, and not only their needs as suppliers, but what their customers are going to need, who are the constituents that are the ones who are going to be voting for their representatives. And it's a hard thing to get through. But again, I, I look at the SEC rule as a way to begin to amplify the discussion and to really put as I said, I've reviewed a lot of these things. Some of these comment letters that are coming in are 75 to 100 pages long. So I'm not sure what the SEC is going to do with all that. But they're going to learn a lot about the business and what can and can't be done and how we can build a realistic path going forward. Because we all want to get to this net zero objective in 2050. We just have to be able to sustain the businesses along the way that are going to help us get there. You know, Mike, you mentioned that you're reading these comments and everybody wants to be part of the solution. Yet you look at the rhetoric and if you are not in one camp, then you're evil. 
I mean, I saw a post the other day that there's an, an auto company that's not committed to all, all EVs and they're being blasted for being, you know, in the pockets of lobbyists and all this stuff. And it's just the animosity and the rhetoric going on out there is not constructive. It's not helpful. No. I really think, you know, you look at the organization you worked for for so long, they're focused on reducing carbon. They are. They produce hydrocarbon fuels, but they're looking, and we have to look all the way upstream. From the time you extract oil to the time it's consumed in a vehicle, where are opportunities to have a meaningful impact? And let's let's do them. Let's explore them. But we've gotten in this is all or nothing mindset, and it's very dangerous. And the financial institutions, my perspective is they're a little bit more pragmatic than that, but they are shifting resources away from traditional energy. And I think that's contributing to some of the, Jeff, some of the price dislocations we're seeing mm-hmm. that we're not – we came out of the COVID and the energy companies are no longer being encouraged to produce. They're being discouraged to produce from governments, from investors. And that is really why we're in the situation we're in. It, there's a big disconnect between where we're going and how we're taking care of people. And we need to raise a level and the interest of people to the same level that the environment, or we're going to find ourselves in this quandary repeatedly as we go through this rocky transition. I want to go back to a point that that Mike had mentioned earlier about how how our industry, you know, we are close to the consumers. We have connections. I spent the, the better part of a day with a retailer with two stores yesterday, and and just watching him, uh, somebody would come in and it's like, hey, today's your last day of school. Congratulations. He knew these kids. They're cut the customers. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody else came in. Hey, how's your mom's dad doing? You know, it, it knew exactly what was going on. There was a real connection with the community. And it, it's not just like, hey, how you doing kind of conversations. They know the community. So it, it strikes me that there's a real opportunity. They, they have these conversations every day with their customers right. that they can continue to, to just have a little bit more of a conversation with people developing policy. Any suggestions, Mike and John, for how they can get started? Is there a place to go to say, hey, you know, I, I got something to say on this because I'm part of the community. I'd like to weigh in. Yeah, I, I'll start by saying, uh, you know, one of the groups that I've had some discussions with on this whole SEC thing is uh, is Sigma and NATSO. And uh, I know that they are coming up in July with their uh, annual legislative meeting. And uh, others have encouraged it, and I certainly encourage that individuals uh, take advantage of opportunities like that where you can come to Washington and have real discussions. People have to realize, and John, you know this really well, and I'm sure you do too, Jeff. Mm -hmm. You get about five or 10 minutes if you're lucky with a legislator, and you may not get it with a legislator, you may get it with a staffer. But you've got to be able to go in and do that. And I'm one that's, you know, coming, you know, uh, to, to my heritage of, 40 plus years uh, with a major uh, oil company and having come up through the uh, marketing, refining supply ranks, I've always said that customers know those companies best through the brand that they represent. And there is an opportunity going forward for every one of those major suppliers to be able to show progress that they're going to make on this road from now until 2050 and actually show the customers what are we doing to you know solve these problems and that's an opportunity to be taken and again take advantage of every opportunity that you possibly can to talk locally at a state level and at a federal level with representatives to help them understand your business. And I'll reemphasize, not just your business, but understand what it means to the customers who are their constituents. Yeah, and I think just to capitalize what Mike said, retailers don't have to go it alone. They can. They can go to listening posts with their legislators. They can go to town halls. They can go to us. And we encourage them to do that. But your local association, your state association, NACS, Sigma, NATSO, they all do an energy marketer association too. They all do fly-ins. They all do um, events and have programs and set up to facilitate that engagement. And I'll add this, that as a former congressional staffer, we need resources. 
Congress needs people in the district they can call to get honest input. When you engage with your legislator, don't always go hat in hand. Don't always go asking for something. Don't always go and don't have a combative stance to it. Even if you disagree with the legislator you're meeting with, present yourself as a resource, as a part of the community, as somebody who can help them understand the implications of the policies they're thinking. That's going to go so much further than going in and calling them names and challenging everything they stand for. Bring solutions. Yep. yep. If you Bring can talk solution. to customers, you can talk to your elected leaders. It really is that easy. Now, it's, before we let you go, Mike, we have trivia. And, uh, aha. Uh-huh. There's the I was music. Wondering, I was wondering if we were doing this. There's the music. So, uh, what we do is we try to find uh, questions that relate to the industry that, that may be something that also apply to, to our guests. So, you talked about your time back in the industry. Um, this is a little before your time because we're talking about early gas stations. So, the early gas stations, they were known for selling TBA in addition to traditional fuel. What mm. did TBA stand for? Did it stand for tobacco, beer, and auto repairs? Tomatoes, berries, and apples, because they sold a lot of produce. Tires, batteries, and accessories. Or, to be announced, they sold whatever they could find. (laughs) I'm going to really date myself here, because my career started as a marketing representative with uh, Mobile Oil in Connecticut. And uh, I sold tires, batteries, and accessories. And you are correct. So, yay, a winner. Um, You will find a tire, a battery, and an accessory in the mail to you, courtesy of Nax. Um, The tire's old, the battery is dead, and the accessory is out of date. But um, congratulations. It has been a pleasure to be with you here today, guys. Um, Hopefully a lot of people get an opportunity to listen to this uh, podcast, and uh, it pays benefits. So, uh, Thank you for everything you do for Fuels Institute, for the council, for the industry pleasure. as a whole. Um, you bring a wealth of experience and perspective, and it is a great honor to have you on our board and working with you on a, on a regular basis. Thank so, Mike, you. If there's anything I can do to help, let me know. Where's the website? Where can they find out more about your organization? Well, accf.org is uh, our organization, and uh, we are all about Uh, maintaining economic growth, uh, good policy, and uh, making sure that the ability to access capital uh, continues uh, at a reliable and affordable level to keep economic growth going. And John, kudos to you. It was awesome to go to the Fuels uh, Institute meeting, Fuels 22. Um, with the whole focus on decarbonization and just digging in um, over a a series of days into the topic and covering all these angles. It was super well done. And for those who are not familiar with the Fuels Institute, it's fuelsinstitute.org. And uh, check out all the information there. Really, really good stuff. Um, Thank you both for joining us today. Uh, Thank you for listening today. If you are not a subscriber, please do so. We are growing that list weekly. Uh, Join us every week. And thank you all for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.